SSP TV and the Hazelton Standard Speaker present Good Sports with Dave and Ken. Welcome to Good Sports with Dave and Ken. He's Dave Seaman, Standard Speaker Sports Editor. I'm Ken Cara, the SSP TV Sports Director. And sitting with us is Russ Kanzler, um, former professional baseball player, current Hazelton Area High School baseball coach. Happy to have you, Russ. I said Russ is the official guy you get when you're doing a sports show. You're so good on television. <laughs> you, you can talk. You can talk about a lot of subjects. Um, Fred Barletta, former sports director here, um, current athletic director at the Hazelton Area High School, started a show. Started with you guys sitting down talking. Um, my first story here at SSP TV when I came back to work um, after college was with Russ. We played some video games. We'll get into that. And Dave, you said, you know, who we should get for show number one on our podcast slash web show. Unanimous. It was unanimous. Yeah. Unanimous. Yeah. There was a meeting actually with standard speaker execs and they were like, Russ Russ Kansler. Kansler's the guy. Russ Why Kansler. is that? What do you think? I mean, you interview him a lot. You've interviewed him from Little League to going to professional to now he's a coach. All these different ways we've seen Russ. What, what makes him such an interesting interview and talk and person? Well, until a couple of years ago, he always called me Mr. Seaman. So I like the respect <laughs> level that he gave me all the time. But um, no, Russ has always been a gentleman. He's always handled himself very well in interviews and uh, win, lose. If he was going through a hot streak, bad streak, I'm sure there are sometimes he didn't want to talk to me. Uh, but uh, that was the assignment. And uh, I've enjoyed uh, my interactions with Russ uh, first as a player, like you said, way back into his little league days, going through high school and uh, through his professional professional career and now watching him as a coach and watching how his team responds to him, you know, I, I, I'm honored to know him and uh, it, it's a pleasure that he's our first guest. Thank we, you, Dave. We, we want to make sure you're going to come back too, so now <laughs> well, all, all those really nice things <laughs> it's a good out of start, the way. Yeah. Russ, um, one of the things we want to do here on the pod, podcast web show is we're working with two sports journalists. Focus on that a little bit. You've been interviewed numerous times in that. What is it like when you're playing a game and you get out and there's a scrum of media waiting for you? For us, for me, I remember going there, especially if it was minor league or professional. I'm nervous. I'm like, I got to get my question in. What's it like for the athlete who's facing that? Are you kind of just like, I, I want to I have a sandwich. I want to yeah, like, yeah. after a long day. I mean, and has that changed over the years for you as you've taken on different roles and you see the media maybe in a different light? I think I've... I've I feel like I've certainly gotten better at it from, you know, when I was a little kid coming up through, you know, Little League high school and you're, you're trying to put together your thoughts uh, in the right way and articulate them the right way. Uh, and, and then you get more and more experience at it through, through professional baseball. It, it's kind of interesting, though, because when you're in high school and you're, and you're getting interviewed as a player, usually it means you did something well. Uh, on the field. So it's very easy to, to kind of talk on, on a high note. But then when you get into pro ball, and like you said, you, you could have a terrible game and then somebody approaches you to ask you uh, kind of the negative question of, of, of what went wrong and what do you have to do to get better. So so that was a little bit of a challenge and understanding that. And, and obviously you see it with athletes every single day that, you know, don't handle it the right way. And, and now we have the technology and the media that it, it's going to be out there within, within seconds. So I think it's really important for athletes to, I used to practice sometimes, um, you know, and, and just kind of practice, okay, this is how I want to make a standard answer so I don't end up on, on Sports Center tonight. So, <laughs> so far, I think it's been okay, yeah. <laughs> Done all right. Dave, you wanted to get into the background of Russ a little bit and his playing days, working up to being um, a professional and now where he's at. My earliest memories of Russ Kanzler, how many years, a year or two younger than me, two years younger than me? What year did you graduate? 2003. So I'm a year, year younger than you. Year younger. Yeah, okay, yeah. so I knew Russ, and actually this is why I have the Hafey hat. I have a Hazelton area hat here. I knew Russ at Bishop Hafey High School. Right, yeah. Great athlete, great guy, and then went over to, to Hazelton. Those are my earliest memories. But what are yours kind of, and where, where do we want to start this, this Russ Kanzler look back a little bit? Well, I go back just re reading about him as a young Little League player, and this kid that always would hit doubles and triples, usually get a single and played well defensively in the paper. But Russ was always a double, triple hitter, even a home run as he got older in Little League and uh, he became a Little League All-Star and uh, you know I got to cover him that's the first time I got to cover him as a Little League All-Star I believe I did a Father's Day feature that that's year right. and uh, well, Russ's uh, father Mike uh, a Little League coach for a lot of years and his mentor and you know uh, we could ask Russ about his, his father's influence it's been very uh, big impact on his career and uh, I got to talk to him in Little League and going through high school but it just uh, the, when I finally got to see him play I just remember the ball jumping off his bat it's just like one of those players that you see and you, you heard the sound off the bat uh, you know it, it wasn't a typical 
uh, swing. A lot of guys hit pings with you know off the aluminum bat. But Russ's ball jumped and it carried, and uh, uh, they went a long way too. A lot of his balls that I saw hit, and that carried over into high school. I didn't cover him his first year in high school. He got to play as a freshman in high school. The late great Babe Conway, who was our sports editor at the time, he covered the uh, the, ba- the Hazel Neary baseball team. Russ was playing right field at the time, so that's where I guess they stuck all the freshman baseball players at the time. But he got to play in the lineup, and uh, and uh, Babe Conway was said, where do you see this kid play? And I said, oh, well, I do remember him seeing him play as a young player. No, he's going to be the real deal. And he talked about, and Babe, Babe Conway was involved in the uh, uh, coaching end too. He coached Shenandoah Valley for a long time and he knew baseball and he understood the game. And he said, this, play, this kid's going to go places. And once I got to see him the following year at Hazel Nary, he started as a, at, went to shortstop as a sophomore uh, on a very, very, very good team. Uh, and then, you know, carry that on throughout his high school career. And, uh, and you just watch him blossom. And then with more work and more uh, time, uh, Russ definitely uh, flourished as a baseball player. I want to get to your dad, because I don't know if I've ever talked to you about, about that a little bit. But was that pressure when there were people like Dave Seaman out there? And you knew there were people, even me, I remember covering you for Channel 13. I was an intern at the time. And I was like, I can't miss a Cougar baseball game because I want to see a Russ Kanzler at bat or I want to see him play. Was that, I mean, it's probably kind of nice to feel that. But was it pressure too? Like, oh, man, I got to be that guy and I have to get to this next level. And you're only in, in high school at this point. Sure, the yeah. kids you're coaching now might be going through this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think... You have to acknowledge it. I think part of handling, you know, playing in those pressure situations is acknowledging that it's okay to be a little bit nervous. I think when you try to pretend that you're not nervous, you know, that's when that's when you start to play a different style of game. So, you know, I, I think nerves are good. I try to tell my players all the time, like, it's good to be nervous. You just have to go out there and, and make something happen right away, whether it's just a dead sprint onto the field and that flushes the emotions out or you know you 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 swing at the first pitch you like you foul it off and and you kind of check yourself into the game or you know I always liked when I got a ball hit to me in the first inning because I felt like it kind of relaxed me into the game so you know to to I think it's great when you're nervous because it shows that you care and, and and you have a passion for the game and it's important to you if if you weren't nervous at all I'd almost question why you were doing it so so I certainly felt that you know I think you know the other step for me and this is where I'm really grateful for my father was you know he we always talked about preparation you know and always being prepared for every situation I mean since I was a young kid I would always pull him you know down to the park with me and 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 hey throw me a pop-up over my right shoulder I want to be able to make that play or or, or give me a backhand in the hole or hey throw me a couple outside pitches I want to know that I can cover that all right let's say there's two runners on now and there's two strikes I mean I could go back through millions of scenarios that we rehearsed uh, so that was almost the way I looked at it was it's just like preparing for a test in school you know if you study hard enough you study long enough when you actually go to take the exam it's actually fun and easy because you know you put the work in so I don't know if there there was a scenario that I wasn't really prepared for uh, especially in high school, and I think that's that's something that really helped kind of ease those nerves. You know, I, I, I felt like I owed it to myself to to, to be very confident in the, in the games. I think one of the cool things is um, lessons translate from sports to life, and obviously because everything is is life. But if you watch me on the news sometimes, if there's a tough word in like the first story, I'm like, oh, glad I got that one out of the way. Or you do feel the pressure, you get a little nervous, and then you'll, you'll be able to see my face or see me, and you'll be like, oh, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. How, How now, now, brown cow? cow. Oh, <laughs> Russ, same page there. But you'll see it, and I'll get nervous, or I'll slip over this. So it's like that everywhere. And I think I'm going I'm to use that Russ Kanzler wisdom right now yeah. to kind of embrace the nervousness yeah, and that's um, good. Means kind you of care. rise up to the yeah. occasion. Where do you want to go from here with, with Russ's story? So we got him through maybe to Little League. There was a nice Father's Day piece you that did. That was great. Um, yeah. That'd be cool yeah, too. That was awesome. Find that in the standard speaker archives. He was only 10 archives. years old at the time, maybe, yeah, maybe yeah. 12. I don't know. I think he mm-hmm. did uh, with, with uh, Mr. McGowan as well and Matt with, with Hazleton Little League. I think there was another, there was another uh, father-son combination in that article too. That was great. That was really cool. And then you move on, Russ. Obviously, there's high school playing at Hazleton area. What was it just playing baseball for you, um, having fun? Or because I think people sometimes when they find someone who made it to the highest levels of any profession, they want to know, well, how'd you do it? How how did you get there? Was it just kind of playing and and you were just enjoying the game, or, or was there like a secret kind of that that you share with people? Um, it was first off, I I, th- I think it was my own thing. Um, I think that was really important because because going back to my father, he was not a, a baseball player at all. He was actually he was a football player. He he was a quarterback at, at Bloomsburg University, and and he, and he was a good football player. And you know, I'm sure it, w- it was difficult for him that I really did not take the football at all. You know, uh, 
and he tried, and I just uh, I, I didn't <laughs> like it. I didn't like getting hit. What was it about baseball? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you'll have a ball thrown yeah. at you at you know uh, x amount of miles yeah. per hour, but what, what about baseball really <laughs> stuck with you? I, I don't know. Uh, there's there's something about the game I remember watching when I was a really young kid, and I just uh, I just thought. I fell in love with the sensation of hitting hitting the ball, you know, and that was that's always been my thing is has been hitting. Uh, so so something from a young age kind of entranced me about that and uh, and and grew a passion and and thankful to my family for supporting me through that because you know again it was it was my own thing and that's one thing that you know I, I see a lot of kids that play baseball today and and sometimes I question whose whose dream is it really you know and and that, it's okay if it's not baseball but whatever it is it's got to be your thing because eventually if it's not your thing it's going to burn out a little bit so you know that's that's what started it for me was was I just had a, a, a real love of it and I I, I you know I, I don't think I was ever told to practice I just did it a lot on my own I grabbed my dad a lot and, uh, and and then I watched a ton of baseball. I watched the Braves every night on TBS. You know, I, I at one point I could probably tell you everybody's batting average and who was hitting what and where they were playing and their jersey numbers. And you know, I, ju I just loved it. I had I had a passion for it. So, you know, it, it was fun for me, and and it never felt like never felt like work. You know, I, I felt like I was. I was gifted from uh, from a hand eye coordination standpoint. That that's one thing I know my dad really got right, and I try to do it with my kids is when they when they pick a bat up. He, he used to just we had a stone driveway, so he used to, we had these little pebbles in our driveway, and he always used to just grab these pebbles and throw them at me. I don't I don't know if I hit a baseball until I was like six years old. So I, I think I think that was really cool because. I just found a way to get my bat to, to something very small and it really trained that that hand-eye coordination and and that was uh you know and that was something that i think carried throughout throughout my life um that was cool dave one of the coolest things i've ever seen was actually watching russ shoot a bb gun i mean sometimes you see athletes <laughs> or people who are good at things and i was like and he like handed it to me and you're like go ahead you go and i was like that was impressive and then we started talking about eyesight and um and everything else that you got into hunting eventually i, I did, mean, did yeah, that help yeah. you like when you're looking at yeah that? you still got that eyesight? yeah oh yeah yeah i mean i i think you know look, and especially when you get to the professional level you have you know milliseconds to to react to to a very uh, you know a ball that's that's moving you know and you got to make decisions on strikes you got to make decisions on timing that's all kind of happening happening you know unconsciously so uh you know the hand-eye coordination definitely has to be there i remember reading the, the science of hitting by ted williams when i was a, when i was a junior and and when he was a manager for the senators you know he, the first thing he would always do when when guys were struggling is he'd send them to the eye doctor before he did anything with their swing before he corrected anything it was like well, let's get your eyes checked because if you're if your eyes are bad you know you're never gonna hit so so that that's that's huge and you know I, I got into archery a little later in, in in my life and you know I think the same the same roles are, are certainly true in that as well I, I think what also helped your 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 baseball career was that you played basketball as well sure, and yeah. you know a, a lot of argument now uh, a lot of kids focusing on one sport you played a bunch. You played basketball and you played baseball. You talk about the advantages of playing multiple sports. Yeah, I I think uh, when I when I wrote an article for the for the speaker about you know um, specialization in sports, I, I did a lot of research on that because I know how I felt, but I wanted to I wanted to see if what I felt was was accurate with what you know the sports medicine world was saying and. If I remember correctly, it was like the the, the Journal of Sports Medicine, and uh, they, they talked about the importance of, of young kids playing multiple sports. I think it was like at the age critical ages of, of development athletically at like 11, 13, and 15. The 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 players that played multiple sports uh, once they decided on their on their single sport, they had a greater advantage over kids that just specialized through their life. So they were they were more athletic, they were quicker, they had quicker reaction time, they were stronger. Um, you, you know, so I, I played three sports all the way up until ninth grade, I was a soccer, you know, baseball, basketball guy. And, and, and I think it's multi layered, I think, number one, not only does it give you a little more adv advantage athletically, but, but psychologically as well, too. I mean, I don't think baseball is made to be played 12 years around around the clock or 12 months, or, uh, you know, around the clock. Some of these guys are playing 10 months out of the year. I mean, you got young kids and you're and you're having them play uh, really a grown man's schedule. So uh, I think that I think you see a little bit of burnout from that as well. 
So I, I always felt by playing basketball in the high school level, you know, it, it just prepared me naturally for baseball. When, 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 when basketball finished and I joined the baseball team with the conditioning program, it was almost a joke because I was in great shape. I felt good. I knew I had my agility from being on the court. And, uh, you know, I usually tell this story as well. I, when, when the draft process started happening for me and, and, and professional teams were starting to take notice, um, the, the only – you know, team that didn't come and see me play a baseball game was the Chicago Cubs, who ironically ended up drafting me. And and uh, they have a great scout in, in Billy Blitzer, who who was there a very long time and is still there as a pro scout. And uh, when when he when they drafted me and and Billy came to my house, my dad asked, I don't remember getting anything from the Cubs or or seeing you at any games or anything. I said, Yeah, I went to go see him play basketball. I wanted to see what type of athlete he was. I wanted to see how he moved on the court. You know, in in his secondary sport, I wanted to see how he handled throwing up four bricks in a row did he did he was he a good teammate you know how do he handle losing because he's like I, I knew he could play baseball and I knew what he could do and I saw him play but uh, you know he said I, I wanted to see him play basketball so I try to share that story as much as I can with kids to, to encourage them to, to continue to develop athletically and I'll even say it from a coaching standpoint you know it's pretty apparent the guys on our team that play multiple sports when you watch how they move how they feel the ground ball you know how they swing the bat the arm speed the bat speed uh you can just you can pick out an athlete right away and you could say do you play any other sports and, yeah i'm gonna play soccer i play football or i wrestle or you know i play basketball so I, I think it's big i think it's i think it's really important to, to keep doing that dave i like that you asked that question because i want to go to a sound bite we have now i was recently out of penn state covering dante biazzi pitcher out there graduated from the hazelton area high school drafted as well was it the cubs who drafted him that's right <laughs> just yeah. as well yeah. so i interviewed his coach i'm um, rob cooper and i just i just asked him about athletes from hazelton i said what is it you know about hazelton and baseball right now here's what he had to say and then we'll come back and we'll react to it a bit well look i mean first of all hazelton's known for its baseball it's known for producing baseball players um, there's good athletes there. I like that a lot of the athletes there still play more than one sport, so they're used to being coached uh, by different people. Um, but yeah, there's some there's some good athletes, and you know, obviously the Biazzi family has been <laughs> has got some right there with with Sal and Dante. So you know, I would I would love to have more kids from Hazelton that are like those two. That's for sure. All right, Russ, you hear that? He wants more kids like the Biazzi brothers coming out of your program. But he also hit on, he mentioned, I guess, from a coachability standpoint, sure. he said, I like these kids playing multiple sports because they're, I guess, I guess that's good when you're getting coached by other guys. You're more coach, more coachable? Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with that point. I think that's a great soundbite for people to hear. Um, you know, if, you, if you're around different type of coaches, and I could relate in my career, I mean, I, I played for – you know, eight or nine different managers, dozen different hitting coaches, um, and there's all different personalities within that. So you have to be able to, you know, be yourself and, and understand what people are, are asking of you and interpret their personalities and things that they say. And there's some guys that are harder on you. There's some guys that are that are nicer, that want to be your buddy. And, you know, it all kind of relates back to just developing your character. So I, I think that's outstanding. And, and I would agree wholeheartedly with, with you know, guys playing, playing multiple sports. I think the Biazis are, are an outstanding example of that. It's incredible how much a lot of your thoughts line up sometimes with, I shouldn't say all thoughts, I just mean some headlines I see with, with Joe Madden. Um, oh, yeah. I've heard him you know, say that a bunch of times you know, about multiple sports. I've also heard him talk about, we're getting into different subjects, we're on your background a bit, Russ, yeah. but while we're here, um, launch angle in, in oh, baseball. Yeah. And, and I remember talking to you, we just had a conversation one day about this, and then literally I think Joe came home for something, and the first words out of his mouth, he was talking about launch angle. Or maybe it was even a press conference I watched, and against it, correct? Like how it was just this... Yeah. I don't even know how it came about. One day, I'm just a baseball fan, and yeah. one day I just started seeing this show up. Everywhere. I guess there's more and more stats now. But this there's is a stat. Sense, this yeah. is a stat, maybe to say not as important as, as some of the some of the other ones. Yeah, you know, and, the, and here's the, here's the problem I I have with it. Um, for, it's just a, it's just a measuring tool to see obviously how high you're hitting the ball at the angle that you're hitting the ball with the bat. Uh, and and you know, yes, you're seeing numbers when the launch angle is higher and it's hit at the right velocity, that's going to equal a home run. I don't know if we need those numbers to realize that that's what's going to cause home runs. You know, you have to hit it hard, and you got to hit a little bit higher to hit it over the fence. Um, where the game has changed a little bit is, and the part that kind of disappoints me a little bit is still as a baseball fan, is when you see, you know, a, a huge increase in home runs alongside a, a huge dip in batting average and a, and a large increase in, in strikeouts. I think last year there was, there was, you know, more strikeouts than ever in Major League history, or it was the first year, if I I remember correctly it was the first year in major league history where there was more strikeouts than hits you know so so there's there's this you know 
issue that Major League Baseball is having where, you know, attendance is down, viewership's down, and, and, and then you're seeing those numbers where there's a ton of strikeouts. I, I forget what the average last year was, balls being put in play. I think there was like two and a half minutes in between just a ball being put in play. So people are trying to make the case that, you know, maybe maybe they're getting a little bored at watching guys swing and miss three times and not put the ball in play and, and move runners and, and, you know, put together good at bats. I, I can personally see that. I don't have a problem with with major league hitters trying to hit more home runs. You know, guys that are physically mature and and have worked on their swing for years and can do little things right and then want to make those changes to to produce more power. I I think that's great for those guys for their career. The other issue I have is when younger kids see that and they think this is this is the way you know this is the way to change my game and this is the way I'm going to become like a Josh Donaldson or or whoever uh, because what the kids don't understand and what's not taught to them is that um, these are guys that can do anything with the bat. These are guys that if you ask them to hit a ball in the hole, they could do it. If you ask them to hit a fly ball to center field, they could do it. You know, if you ask them to move the runner or hit a gapper or hit a chopper, they can they can control their bat that way. A 14 year old probably doesn't have that yet. So and and probably doesn't have the strength. So so their best ball on a on a, on a high launch angle would you know, the major league numbers would support is probably a fly out. So I, I've seen a lot of kids put put our team in perspective and we have we have we have some guys that can hit and we have some guys that can hit well. I think we have three balls that we've hit over the fence, you know, just to put that in perspective. So so you know, and you talk to I use another guy like Joe McCarthy, who's a, who's a big prospect for the Rays. And Joe was like one of the biggest high school players I think I've ever seen in my life. I mean, he could have played football in, in college. He could have played basketball in college. I think he had two home runs in high school, you know, but but he established the, the right type of swing, you know, a, a good line drive approach, a short, simple swing. And then as he matured physically, he's learned to hit a little more home runs. So um, so I, I think that's probably where Joe and I compare on that on that topic. Yeah. So you kind of have to catch up with your bat physically. I mean, you get yeah. a good swing down, and then as your body kind of matures, right. it, that goes into yeah. your swing. I never yeah. thought of it. Yeah, and you're looking at you're, the other part of that, too, is you're looking at you got Major League Baseballs that are that are juiced. You know, guys are swinging at those balls, and, and they have the best lumber that you can possibly have. I mean, that, that wasn't bad, but but you could, but could but what you'd see in a Major Leaguer's hand is the, is the best quality you know lumber that you can get as a, as a hitter uh, and, and, and the best baseballs that you'd want to hit, you know, under the bright lights you know and, and a smaller strike zone and all those factors kind of play into it so i would just love to see kids keep with a good good line drive up the middle approach and and uh and then grow from there nothing wrong with hitting a, a ball behind a runner and taking sending him the third base from first base correct it, yeah uh, yeah I, I had a lot of place in the game for that i had you know manny acta was my manager with cleveland and i remember uh, one of the meetings we had in spring training uh where he he said like look we got to be ready to put the ball in play at all times. If we put the ball in play X amount of times, we're going to win the game, you know, and, and we challenge the defense. And this is major league defenses. And he, and he would say, like, the only time it's okay for you to strike out is if the alternative would have been a double play. There's really no good time to, to strike out. We need you guys to just keep putting the ball in play. So, um, and, I, and I certainly preach that at the high school level. I, if you're watching, there's actually, we want to do this two ways. You go to the Standard Speaker um, website, SSP TV website. We have a podcast. You can download um, the file, listen to it whenever you want. You can also watch the um, webcast. I'm pointing this out because if you are watching, we have one of Russ's bats here. And you kind of referenced it recently, talking about lumber and that. Um, Russ, I have this. It's signed by you. And the first thing I noticed, it's almost half the size of me, this bat. <laughs> and I tried to pick it up, Dave. And it was another thing as a non-athlete, you know, sometimes when you're a sports reporter and that, it's good to get some perspective. And can I was you like, pick up bats on the soccer field. You didn't pick up no, bats on the see, and I was also was like, like, baseball is so hard. I was like, I can't even lift this thing up, let alone put it to to a ball. Okay. So Russ goes on to professional baseball, drafted by the Cubs, but you break in with the Rays, correct? Yeah. I mean, that was your major league debut. Got first hit, Yankee Stadium. Yeah. I just watched, I'm a Red Sox fan, I think Michael Ch Ch Chavez, if I'm saying his last name right, hit his first home run, and I watched his mother's yeah. response, you know, over the – was your family there, or were they um, – uh, my, my family, family was at Fenway, so so I got called up at the end of the AAA season and uh, flew down to Tampa for one game, and then we, we went on a long road trip. It was Camden Yards, Fenway, Yankee Stadium, back to Tampa. So uh, my family did come to Camden Yards, and I, and I didn't get in that series at all. Uh, and then they were there at Fenway and actually saw my – my first plate appearance, which ended up being a walk at Fenway. Uh, so that was really cool. And then 
they had to go back to work. So, <laughs> so I went to, so, so I got to, got to New York and uh, had some buddies come in, which was really cool. Um, and then, uh, and then had my, my first hit in Yankee stadium, which I, I was out very spoiled first experience in the big leagues. I mean, to go to Camden, uh, a lot of emotion there for me because I remember being a high schooler and going to a showcase at Camden and now I was back as a major leaguer. So to see that kind of come full circle was really cool. And then, I mean, walking around Fenway park, I still get chills when I, when I think about it, uh, you know, seeing, seeing the, the green monster and the, and Ted Williams red chair and in, in right field and, you know, it's just got this this incredible culture where I don't think the modern parks have that. You know, they're, everyone's right on top of you. There's, there's you know, 40,000 fans that are just right on top of the field making a lot of noise, you know, and then you get to the modern ones and everyone seems to be just like pushed away from the field <laughs> and really put everybody up there. Um, so it was, it, it was really cool. And, and Yankee Stadium is like the modern Roman Coliseum, you know. Uh, so I was very, very fortunate, yeah. What I remember most about that, excuse me, is I, I remember – not only did you single in that game, you put a ball against the fence. If oh, I remember I your second time up, I that know. was like that close to going <laughs> I out. Know, no. I know. It was off I, Batanzas too. And, yeah. and I think I was down uh, down two strikes. And, and oh, I, as soon as I hit it, I thought, this is Yankee Stadium. And it's right center. It made it out. Uh, <laughs> but but that, 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 that was really cool. I mean, I'm yeah, super I grateful for that experience. Yeah. I think some of the most magical moments in life are the ones that make you feel like a kid again, that kind of bring you back a little bit and you you get that joy again. Like life, you, you forget about the responsibilities and that you just live to live. That's how I try to live every day. Forget yeah, it. you got to do Yeah, you got to get back to that. I'm not very good at that. I need like Russ Wood. You need to like write a book of quotes or something. Yeah, man. And I'll just like keep referring to this podcast. I'm just going to keep listening to it. But that, that's so magical to me. And did you feel like that, though, after that? Like, do you call your parents? And you're like, guess oh, what? I, yeah. I'm sure they knew, but yeah. you're like, oh, guess what? Yeah. It was a single. Yeah. It was great. Yeah, my, I, 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 ton of support. I mean, not just for my family, but the entire community has always been a huge source of support for me. Uh, you know, people just always in my corner. So, you know, when I was down in the minor leagues and it looked like I was never going to get out of a ball, I just tons of people coming up to me when I was home and, hey, keep your head up, man. We're really rooting for you. You're making us proud. And and that that always meant so much to me because there were some some tough times, you know, in those in those days in the minor leagues. So when it when it kind of came full circle, yeah, it was <laughs> like. Joe Nicholas, my my little league teammate, was actually at that game, <laughs> screaming my name when I came up, and and we had a cool moment afterwards, you know, talking about that. So it, it really was a, a culmination of a lot of years of 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 hard work, of struggle, of of doubt, of insecurity, of regained confidence, you know, and and to to, to do it there, and, and and then it was you know it was kind of romantic for me because my dad's team is the Yankees, so for me to do that at Yankee Stadium was was really special for him, for my grandfather, you know. Uh, it was awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. awesome. Dave, it might have been in your article you wrote about Russ going to coach Hazel Tenaria this year. And I think it was Russ, if it's another athlete, please, someone correct me. Um, had a showcase in Baltimore, but had to get back for a district. Yeah. Was it a basketball game or, uh, or baseball? Game. We're baseball, just, yeah. you, were talking about the, you were talking about, I think, the importance of, of high school athletics at that moment in your, in your piece. Yeah, I mean, we, we talk about your sophomore year, which is still one of the best high school teams that I covered. Oh, I mean, you yeah. were a sophomore at the time, which probably helped your – you know, maturation along because Absolutely. you had a lot of outstanding teammates with Mike Kelchek, uh, Marcus Sat, Pat Dolan, uh, Scott Bisco. Yeah, Scott Bisco. Yeah. I mean, they, they were all great. Uh, Corey Coles, yep. uh, all fantastic players. Um, and that game, they lost in they lost in district semifinals. It was day after the prom, a couple oh, hours after the prom, and, and people don't want to talk about that, but. A prom might have cost Hazelton area district title, maybe yeah, even the state title, more. maybe yeah. more, because that team was loaded. Then, yeah, his senior year, uh, they, I remember he had a, a workout, a showcase at Camden Yards on a Tuesday morning. That's right. And a district final. It was the day after Memorial Day. That's right, yeah. And, and then they raced back. I don't even want to know how fast your dad was driving that day. <laughs> to, uh, Mike, was, Mike, was, Mike was hauling butt coming back <laughs> yeah. on Interstate 81 that day. Yeah. Uh, this was or wasn't the same year as the prom? No, no, this is, that was my senior year. Senior, senior year. Okay, yeah, got it. And then, but right. the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you played Berwick in the district that's final right. your senior year. You beat them a few times that season and uh, ended up losing to Berwick, too. And that's another instance where, you know, things didn't align that well and things fell off and just one bad game away from, you know, being eliminated. And that's what happened that game. But I would have liked to see that team make a, a nice little run as well. But, yeah. uh, well, and, I mean, you know. When you think about some of the – I mean, you go back to that, that year I was a sophomore. I think we had six or seven seniors that went on to play – college baseball that year your number uh, four pitcher 
ended up as one on the record books. Uh, Jay Grabelny. That's right. On the record books at East Stroud's, where he hardly pitched that he year. He hardly That's pitched, how good, yeah. yeah. And, and it was almost kind of a similar situation we have where, this year where we have a ton of arms, and, and you're thinking, how do I get this guy in? You know, because we have so many good guys that are pitching well. And then my senior year, being with Kyle Landis and Justin Gutsy, two other guys that ended up playing professional baseball, you know, you kind of look back and giggle a little bit when you think, hey, you win the district championship, you know. Uh, but uh, but that's that's the great thing about baseball is, you know, anyone can win on on, on any day. So I can't, See, I can't believe you just said that's the great thing about baseball. I think about this. Everything I do, as you probably know, comes back to um, Penn State football. And <laughs> I, I'm not even an athlete, which I think makes no, it even no. interesting. But um, I think about some great Penn State teams, and I think about all the talent they had, and I look back and I think they didn't win a Big Ten championship that year and I, and I as a fan I get almost frustrated but then I think you know what it was great just watching them you as an athlete Russ you you had such joy you were like yeah. oh man I still had fun and yeah. maybe still okay we didn't win it but there was joy in that statement there, you were like that's the great thing about baseball is yeah. you never know you know and, and I, I really do come from the school of thought baseball is not always about talent. I think football, basketball, like you're playing in a series or you're playing a big football game, like if you have bigger, stronger, faster guys that are better coached, they're, they're going to end up winning that game. But baseball, it doesn't always have to be about talent. I'll, I'll tell you, the, the best run that I had uh, in the minor leagues was for three years with the same really core group of guys where in, in high A, we won the, the Florida State League, uh, won a championship there. And then the next two years in the Southern League and AA, it was the same nucleus of guys. And, and we were in the championship both years. I think the one year, you know, we were in first place from, from game one to game, you know, 162. So it was really cool. But I will say with that group of guys, it was, it, there was a, there was a, you know, a brotherhood, a bond, a chemistry that we had. We loved playing together. There was never any squabbles. Um, you know, we just, just enjoy going to the ballpark every single day. So that camaraderie, I think is, is really, really important. Uh, and I try to preach that as much as I can with our boys this year, uh, to, to pull for one another and, and be excited for one another when somebody does well. So, uh, I think that's important. I really do. Any psychology, any psychology to that too? I mean, have you seen guys maybe you looked at and thought, mentally, you got to get on track because you could just lose it in sports or in baseball. And I think we're recognizing it more and more. I did a story on sports psychology last year, and I've seen more oh. and more high school kids go to sports psychologists. And I think of me when I was a high school athlete, I was I didn't have it. You yeah, know, if I yeah. if I had a bad day, that that was it. I mean, you you always seem like like you mentioned it too, a mature kind of guy. Um, since he was younger, who had a good head on your shoulders. Um. Is that something to consider when you're even when you're coaching yeah. kids now? I mean, is it is it something to to think about? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I think everyone should should talk to somebody. I really do. Uh, from a, from a sports standpoint, from a young age, and and learn the you know the right tools and the ways to respond to failure, or expectations. Um, you know how to prepare the right way mentally for a game. Uh, look, it was easy for me in high school because I didn't experience a whole lot of failure in high school. You know, but it was a struggle for me when I got to pro ball, and I really got my first taste of, of real failure. I, I I I would be lying if I said I reacted well to it. I, I did not, you know. And and there's a million different ways that people, you know, navigate through failure and, and through insecurity. And and it really wasn't until I started talking to you know a sports psychologist. And and we're very lucky because every organization has two or three that make their rounds through all the minor league teams. And I always was like, Oh, this guy's here. I'm not, I'm not talking to him. I don't want to be the guy. Everybody thinks it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, that's the attitude. Though. Right. I mean, you know, yeah. but, but I remember it was a year in double a and I started playing third base and, you know, I was making errors and I didn't feel confident over there. And I just, I grabbed them one day and I, and I just said, Brian, look like you gotta, we gotta talk a little bit, man. Like I am a, I am a nervous wreck right now, you know, and, and, and just getting some stuff off your chest and, and having someone listen to you and give you some things to kind of talk, you know, some, some, you know, some affirmations that you can say to yourself throughout the game and, and the way to prepare mentally that I had a different way I never thought of really changed my whole perspective. I mean, what people don't realize, and it's not talked about a lot is, is all the best major league players have these people. They, they, and they use them. You know, and they're not ashamed of it because they don't have to be. They're 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 stars and they make tons of money. But, you know, they all they all use those type of people because I mean, when you look at a guy who's playing in front of sixty thousand people and then on national television and and he looks, you know, cool as a cucumber. I mean, there's 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 a reason. That's that's premeditated. So so I I, I think. You know, I think kids can, there's a ton of great resources out there. Um, I, I give our guys the mental game of baseball, which was a great book that I read probably four or five times cover to cover. Um, you know, and I think that's a great reference. So, so I would, I try to tell our guys all the time. I mean, that's, that's half the battle. Yeah. 
Uh, one of the things too, like when you go through those downtimes, I've done a story with you on your faith too. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it's not talked about a lot in the no. national media too, but that plays a big part too. Your faith. Yeah, yeah, and my faith has always has always kept me grounded. Um, you know, I came, I, I I was raised Catholic and 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 was raised in a Catholic family, but I felt like I really really made a conscious decision to to come to Christ when I was nineteen, twenty years old, and and. I came to, to Christ when I was probably at my, my darkest professional moment, you know, of uncertainty and, and failure. And, you know, um, I had experienced success and I, and I realized, you know, that success wasn't going to provide me happiness, you know, true, real happiness and peace and contentment. So, um, you know, I, I really started reading the Bible a lot more and praying a lot more and, and found, you know, that there was a whole bigger picture outside of baseball, you know, so, so the, the 0 for fours weren't as bad. And, and I was more grateful for the other things in my life, the family that supported me, the friends that I had, the opportunities that were in front of me. And, and that's something that has, has carried me, you know, to this day, because, you know, again, at the end of the day, it, it's, it's, it's great to be a professional athlete. And there's a lot of, you know, you're treated differently. You're 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 looked on as in, in a different way, and and sometimes not appropriately. But you know, you we we all, in my opinion, we all belong to God, and 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 I'm one of God's children. So you know, I have to honor Him first with with how I play the game and how I carry myself. So I think that that gave me such a level of of, of peace and, and contentment. I remember, you know, going into my 2011 season. Um, you know, it's, and it's always a battle. I was so nervous to be playing in AAA. I mean, that was my first experience. Like, there were some bigger stadiums, there were some larger crowds. I'm I'm playing against some very seasoned major league veterans that are down in AAA, and and I'm you know I'm struggling. I'm 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 inconsistent. I remember the month of April, and uh, you know I just remember praying on it a lot, and 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 reading in the Bible, and and just you know I remember there's a verse in in the book of uh, the Gospel of Luke that he talks about you know not worrying about your life that. You know, you can't add any value to your life by worrying. You can't add another day to your life by worrying, you know. And, and I just, man, I, and it gave me such contentment. I went, I remember the rest of the season, I just thought, man, I'm going to dedicate this season to God and, and uh, you know, play it like I'm 12 years old at Valley West, that whatever happens, happens. And I know that I'm safe, that, that, that he has me and he has a plan for my life. So, you know, I don't think it's ironic that I ended up having my best statistical season because even if I didn't, if I if I hit two two ten, I, w I was still very very happy with where I was, you know, in my faith. So, so I think you're right, Dave. I think it's not something that that's brought into the conversation a lot, and and I think it would shock some people to to know how many guys, um, you know, are are men of faith in the game that that practice their faith and um, you know are going to Bible studies and and draw on that for a source of inspiration. Um, and I don't know why it's not in the conversation, but I, I think it's important because. You know, again, I think young kids watch baseball players and they aspire to do that. Uh, and then and then when you get there, you know, you think, OK, well, now what? Some of the more miserable people that I played with were some of the guys that were making the most money. And you think, well, this should this guy should be really happy. He should feel really good with where he's at. But, well, he wants more money or some guys making more than him or, you know, he didn't get the coverage he wanted or this guy has a nicer car. You know, it, it would blow your mind. Some of the stuff that that these people consume themselves with. So I think that's an important part of the, of the conversation as well. Again, how much is that faith challenge, too? I mean, you go through some disappointments. Yeah, you had a couple opportunities to play Major League Baseball, but when that doesn't happen, when that realization hits yeah. that, okay, well, this isn't going to work out for me, yeah. how, how, how much is that faith challenge? Yeah, you know, and I don't think, I don't think my experiences are, are much different than anybody else's that, that have, you know, a plan for their life and, and want things to go a certain way for them. And, and when it doesn't go that certain way, I, I mean, we all kind of question why. Um, I've, I've learned to you know, understand that there's a, there's a perfect plan in place. You know, I, I can't say with, you know, any certainty, my path to the major leagues was really anything that I did. If I look at it, I owe, I owe my experiences to, to somebody else in every step of the way for a huge portion of my life. It was my father. You know, if I did not have that man in my life who, who pushed me and taught me the lessons, you know, that I used in my life, 
I'm not getting to where I get to, you know, and then I get someone like Jeff Antolik as a, as a high school coach who gave me unbelievable amount of guidance, you know, I mean, you, you take one false step here, you bust your ACL. I mean, there's so many things that have happened to other people that may have been more, you know, worthy than me. So I, I can't look back on anything, but just be grateful for, for what I have um, and, and what I was able to accomplish because I know that, you know, I, it really wasn't my hand in operating uh, all that stuff. I mean, so, so, with the dis with the disappointment, I look back and I think, okay, I'd love to still be playing baseball. I'd love I would have loved to have a more illustrious major league career. But you know, on the bright side, I, I I'm married to to a beautiful woman who's who's an unbelievable mother, and and I have four beautiful children that I that I get to spend a little more time with, you know, and I get to be I get to be dad a little bit more. So so that that's the stuff that I try to try to focus on. Talking about success, Russ, going back to the year you're the. Um international league mvp and then you get called up you're with the tampa bay rays i wanted to do something here and relive this moment from three <laughs> different um angles so you're with the tampa bay rays it's 2011 i actually remember when you were in new york joe madden called a press conference and invited the local hazelton media yeah and they were actually going to announce the hazelton integration project at that point and i remember going out there and you were coming to the press conference i brought snaps pizza i thought maybe i'll be first in line here or something for the interviews i bring some snaps and farmers and um but I was thinking in the back of my head because the big story in Major League Baseball then was my Boston Red Sox where, you know, they had the Downward wild card spiral. pretty much. Yeah, yeah, they were struggling. Collapse. But, collapse. but the question really was, <laughs> would they collapse enough and would the Tampa Bay Rays be able to catch them? <laughs> so many people asked me this when I was going to interview you guys. And in the back of my and I kept saying, I was like, it, it could happen. But in the back of my mind, as a fan, I was like, it's not going to happen. Yeah, I was like, yeah. this is, just win this one would game. be, yeah, yeah, I was like, yeah. this would be crazy. So the final day of the Major League season, to me, I and even looking back, just as a baseball fan, you have to appreciate this, the greatest last day of ever, ever. Yeah. I mean incredible so I'm going to tell it from my side and then I just want to hear what you guys are doing Dave as you're covering you know there's two Hazleton guys involved here so I was working at another TV station at the time at MLB.tv on like a small um, cell phone and I went out and we used to do the news I guess it was later I guess it was later at night and the Red Sox were still on and they were winning and they went to a rain delay and I remember leaving and going for home and thinking like all right, playoff baseball, here we come, Boston. Sat down in my apartment in the dark and just watched everything fall apart. The Red Sox lose maybe an extras. I, I forget who it was. I, I think it was extra. Yeah. 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 Or, or, or late, yeah. Well, yeah, Papelbon collapsed. And then over in, it was at the Trop. It was at Tropicana That's Field, right, yeah. I believe. Yankees and Rays playing. And just devastation was Longoria with the home run, right? Because that's right, all I remember. Yeah. I just remember going to bed with mixed emotions, being like, I'm so happy Ross is going and Joe, but I was like, I can't believe this happened to to Boston. So, Dave, you're, you're covering it. I mean, you're probably paying attention to everything. What, what were you doing that, that evening? Well, we had just put the paper to bed. We, we passed <laughs> deadline at the paper. And, you know, well, the, like we talked about before, the Rays were down 6 nothing in that game to the Yankees. Yankees had nothing to play for. Yeah, really. nothing. Yeah, they, were, yeah. they were in the playoffs. Yeah. So, the Yankees go up 6 nothing. the Rays... And before you know it, six two, six three, yeah. and Johnson hits the home run. I That's believe right. tied the game or yeah. make it six six, and then you know go extra innings. The Yankees, couple opportunities, maybe players thrown out at home. Uh, they, they had chances to win the game. It gets what was it, the tenth or eleventh inning or something. Longoria hits a home run. I, I don't think a ball ever left to drop faster oh than that gosh, one. It was yeah. a line shot right down the uh, uh, left field line, <laughs> and, and they cleared out of there. And uh, the celebration, you know. And it was mostly Yankee fans, I'm guessing, in the stadium at that yeah, point. But yeah. you know, the Rays fans, they they're you know, they're they're their number of fans there and uh, it was just it was it was insane. Probably the greatest win the Rays ever had. And, and Ross, before we get to you, I mean you've been to my apartment that I used to have in, in Cunningham there. So that was the room, like in the dark. Yeah. Out my wife is sleeping and I was just sitting there. I remember just watching the home run go over and over and over again. <laughs> and so that's where I am in the dark right now, in, in a little bit of shock. And it's one of those things where you just I just kept watching it. Um but you're there. You're at Tropicana Field. Yeah. Just take us through what it's like being a part of a team, being a part of that run. I yeah. mean, that night had to be so, so magical. It was a part of baseball history. I don't know if I've ever been a part of anything where, where grown men acted more like children. <laughs> I mean, we were just like kids on Christmas morning running. So so I actually, I, I pinched hit in that game and <laughs> pretty bad at bat. I struck out against Boone Logan and uh, and, and on, on four or five pitches. I don't think I took the bat off my shoulder. So I was out of the game and... Uh, you know, we were, we were kind of checking back and forth in the clubhouse TV and coming back in the dugout and watching, you know, the, the Orioles and the Red Sox play. And and I remember uh, I was like David Price was down there with us and James Shields and a couple of the other guys. And, uh, you know, we, we watched, um, I think it was Andino that hit the walk-off hit for the Orioles uh, to win the game for them. So that happened, and it might have been 
I don't know, 40 seconds later that, that Longoria hits, hits the home run. So that happens. We run right up the steps and, you know, again, we were like 10 years old. Like, the Orioles won. The Red Sox lost. The Red Sox lost. And, and I'll give Joe a lot of credit because Joe showed zero emotion. And he actually, we're coming up the, the dugout steps from the clubhouse. And he just is kind of like, hey, just <laughs> relax, relax. And then, again, it seemed like a couple moments later, Longoria hits the home run. And, you know, when you look at the, when you look at left field line at the trap, you see it, it's almost like the architect <laughs> knew that was going to happen years down the road. They have the fence is almost only like four or five feet off the ground for about 10 yards and then comes up to a typical wall. So he hooked it right around that that smaller yeah. part of the left field wall. I mean, smoked it. And, and I just... My, my, I was weightless. I, I skipped over the dugout. I think I was one of the first people out onto the field uh, to greet to greet Evan at, at home plate. And then it was just one of the cooler nights because, you know, uh, my wife was there and and she got to kind of celebrate with all the other team wives and, and you know, in the clubhouse behind the scenes and, you know, to 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 pop champagne in the, in the, in the clubhouse afterwards with, all the, in your with eyes. all the media there. I mean, I had the, I had the ski mask on. I, yeah. So it was just, it, it was just a, uh, an awesome, awesome experience for me. It was really cool. It was one of the great treasures of my career. As a true baseball fan, Russ, I feel this is a question that people don't get the opportunity to ask a lot. When do you get the merchandise? When do they come out and be like, oh, here, did they have one? It's, it's already there. there. Like it's you there. just go to your locker yeah. and you're like, oh, it's there. I mean, you do wild card champions, you know, it's, it's in your locker, ready to go. Actually, as you're walking in, as soon as the game, they have the here's boxes here. there in their hand on, put it on, put it on, put it on, you know, here's the hat, put it on. So, um, they 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 know what they're doing. They I was curious doing. about that because that's I what I would so want. When, if you lose, want. they send it to they yeah, send like it to like somewhere. Children so there might yeah, be Red yeah. Sox wild card 2011 it's stuff that's it. all over. So yeah, so, somebody needs to open. You know, <laughs> yeah, we're not sure. it. <laughs> One thing I'm I'm always curious about too. Like they have champagne celebrations. You win, you get in the wild card. Okay, yeah, you made the playoffs. It's a 162 it's game over. season. Yeah. Then you win the wild card game. You have another champagne celebration. You win the league or the division series. Another champagne celebration. <laughs> There's a champagne celebration for, is, for yeah. everything. But is it worth it to the players? I think as fans, sometimes we, we look at that and you say, you still have more baseball to play. But I would think, is it for the players? You're like, it is so hard. And it is, you just need like that moment. Or are we just. You know what those guys are celebrating? bonuses <laughs> <laughs> each step Bonus, of the way bonuses. you're like there's, yeah. a, there's a there's an incremental <laughs> increase at every at every win at every you know uh ring of the the playoffs yeah so they're they might be celebrating there bonuses there yeah. what did you do russ after you know you, you win that division playoff or you win yeah. that get in a wild card then you're not on a roster for yeah, the playoffs. yeah so so how do you watch that game are you allowed to sit in the dugout i actually watch? did not make the tr so it, it was kind of crazy and and you know we showed up to the the, the field the next morning expecting to fly to texas and uh, there was three or four of us. One of them was was Brandon Geyer, who's who who's had a, a very good career in the in the major leagues and, and had a great World Series uh, against the Cubs a couple years ago. Uh, and he was my roommate. So so we actually were put on the you know um, you want to call it the the playoff roster uh, as as an in, in, inactive player. So they sent us down to Port Charlotte, which was really cool. So they sent us down to Port Charlotte, which was about an hour and a half away from Tampa to the, to their spring training facility. And they still had, um, some of their minor leaguers there. So we played in games down there. We, we, we just kind of hung out and stayed fresh in case there was, in case there was an injury. So, so, uh, and then we got to, then we got to go to the games at, at Tampa. So that was, uh, so that was really cool. Yeah, it was a good experience. And Russ, I, I want to tell one more story about Russ and his major league career, and then I'm done. I want, I want to talk about you coach, to, um, coaching um, at the high school level as we're running out of some time here. But I, I've never shared this story, I think, on air. I know I've told you yeah. this, and Dave, I think I told you this, and I think it speaks to Russ's character. Um, I was at a game at Fenway that the Indians were playing, and you were at AAA at the time, and um, Shelly Duncan was in left field, and we had monster seats, me and my buddies. I'm not going to say who or how it happened, but we were on top of the monster, and we just kept chanting Kanzler down at, at Shelly Duncan. And um, about, I forget what inning it was, it was like the stuff you, you have to put up with when you're playing. He just looked up at all of us and was like, I really like Russ. And we everyone just going crazy, Russ. And I was like, that's probably the nicest thing that this that's guy cool, getting man. heckled in Fenway was like, Russ is awesome. You know what I mean? So that was, and that I was like cool. Shelly too. He's a cool guy, man. Yeah, he's a cool guy. That's yeah, put, funny. That's put up funny. with a lot. So Russ, you make the decision to coach um, high school baseball, to come back to your alma mater. What made you want to do that? There's Coaching seems like such a challenge. I know you did, you did it at Valley West. We did a story sure, with yeah, you yeah. At, at SSP TV, but, but it seemed like a bigger decision. It's, it's a lot of time in that. What made you want to come back and, and go through everything? Uh, you know, I, I, I just, I love the game. Um, yeah, I missed it. 
you know, I missed I missed competing. That's why I kind of got into to the little league stuff first because I just wanted to stay around the game as, as much as I can. You know, I, I I do some lessons, I do some training, but nothing beats throwing a uniform on and, and competing out on the field. So uh, when 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 the job opened up for the for the high school position, I, I there was not even really a thought. There was a conversation between me and my wife asking permission, <laughs> but in my mind, I was go, I was going to do it. So uh, so you know that that's what it was for me. I, I just miss I miss competing and 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 preparing for a game and the ups and downs and everything and uh, it's been it's been awesome and as important as it is to take an at bat uh, to pinch hit at in a game that's you know gonna maybe bring the team to the major league baseball playoffs you mentioned the coaches and how much they meant to you how yeah. big is this responsibility you you have now and i'm not overplaying that i mean seriously no, these are your molding young minds yeah and... i don't i don't take it for granted again i was very lucky to have two unbelievable coach i throw coach joseph in there as well as an assistant but but coach live coach joseph and and Coach Antolik, I really have become not only coaches, but but very close friends and mentors uh, for me as an adult. So um, I I don't take that for granted that role that you have as a coach, and and I don't think as an adult you you th realize as much of of an impact as you're making. You know, just a conversation here or there, or uh, you know, some advice that you may give, or the way you run a practice, or you, the way you prepare guys. So so it's a it's a great honor. It really is a great honor, and I and I hope I do do a good service to it. What kind of challenges do you have as a coach? Uh, you know, I, I think I can, like my father, a little bit. I can expect a little too much and be somewhat of a of a perfectionist, and and I want things to happen a little quicker than than the natural process. You know, uh, I, I have very high expectations for this group of kids because I think they're very talented. I think. Uh, there's certainly high school baseball has changed from when I played it. I mean, if, if a kid was throwing 80 miles an hour when we played, that was like Nolan Ryan, you know, and now that kind of seems to be the norm. So baseball talent wise has, has changed. So, you know, with that, you may expect a little bit too much. And, and sometimes you forget these are 15, 16, 17 year old kids. So, um, you know, and dealing with different personalities, you know, I, I think it, it's not so much different than what you see in a, in a professional clubhouse. You have, you know, guys that are real hard workers and grinders and will do everything for you. And then you have some guys that, you know, want to want to know how good they are and they want to they want to be the man. And, you know, and then you have you have some guys from different cultures that we don't speak the same language. So we're trying to, to communicate as best we can and get on the same page, um, you know, and everyone is motivated by different things. So uh, trying to figure out what those things are and, and how to motivate correctly is certainly one of those challenges. Not to go back a little bit, but to go back a little bit, you made me think of this when you mentioned Coach Joseph. What was crazy was when I went out to do a story with um, Dante and Sal Biazzi, who were on the Penn State baseball team, I think um, Dante at this point was redshirting. He just had Tommy John surgery, but they're both out there and, and on the team. And we started talking, and we spent most of our time talking about Cougar basketball. And you talk about the importance of playing um, multiple sports. And then I think it was Sal who, what, got the point record which was Russ Kanzler's. And then we, were ta and then okay. we started talking okay. about you because I was like, here's all these baseball guys <laughs> who too excel. Soon. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. did you talk to Sal about that? Were you like, hey, man, con congratulations? I or, yeah, um... I think I think I did congratulate him at, <laughs> at one point. It took me a couple of years, but no. No, um, and, and look, I think, again, I, the, it's it's more about the le – it's not about, you know, the, the wins and losses are great. And I want to win every single game, and I want us to go as far as we can. But – Really, when you look back, perfect example, I never won a district championship as a high school baseball player. I do not look back on my life and think, mm, my life's pretty good, but if I just won that district championship, then I would feel more of a sense of completeness. What I draw on from my high school experiences are, you know, the lessons that I learned from, from Coach Antolik and Coach Live and Coach Joseph and the way they prepared me and the way, you know, the exciting practices and the confidence we had going into games. So, you know, it, it's the life lessons and the way you build character in, in, in young men that I think is really where your coaching impact is made. I'd love to win state championships. I'd love to be known for that as well. But I think you're really judged as a coach by – you know, maybe 10 years down the road, what kind of young men do you have? Are they are they good community leaders? Are they good husbands? Are they good fathers? Um, you know, are they good employees? Those type of things that, that, that I really want to focus on. We have a couple minutes left, Dave, if you have anything else. But I wanted to finish. I didn't tell you about this. I have this idea. If it doesn't work, I'll just edit it out. But <laughs> Dave and I, and I feel what Dave does very well in the standard speaker, and I've kind of adopted that philosophy. I looked up to Dave. He was one of the guys I looked up to when I started my career and I was younger. And I was like, look, this guy's coming. I have Penn to call State Dave now. I'm a coach. Yeah. I can't call him. Yeah, well, we, we started yeah. doing it. With, actually, I'll call you Mr. Cancer. No, you <laughs> <laughs> was born out of doing Dave Day on um, SSP TV News. Um, but celebrating the good that we have here in, in high school sports and, and in sports and in 
general, not just the stats, but taking a look at some really good stories. The name of the podcast is Good Sports. So I, I was trying to think of good sports moments, Dave, and I don't know. I'll, I'll go first, but recently, can you think of anything that, that has happened recently that was heartwarming? I'm thinking of one article you just wrote with the baseball team that was yesterday when we were writing this. But I want to bring up um, Emily Ryan, who is a race car driver. She goes to MMI, and I went to go do this story with her. I um, got it from Dino Alberto. And he told me, hey, why don't you go? This girl just went down to a driving school. She's 15. I thought, oh, there's the story. You know, she's 15 years old. She's doing these race car, you know, driving around, um, has these big dreams. And when I got there, I was so blown away because her family was very passionate, very, you know, you could tell they all loved each other. But the most amazing thing was it seemed like their whole life was consumed by racing, which is great. You know, you got to have a passion for something. But I started talking to Emily more and more, and you're going to see this on SSP TV News. She is taking Chinese at MMI. She's also racing sailboats, and she's um, really into that. She plays for the Hazleton Philharmonic and she's also in the St. Anne's band. So she's in the classical music. And I sat there and I was like, man, and I'm going home and I'm playing Xbox. You know, I love <laughs> Xbox, Ross, but that is my, my um, good sport story That's kind great. of there. It makes That's me great. think. So shout out to Emily Ryan and look out for that story on SSP TV News also out of left field. Anything, Dave, you've covered recently that made you feel, feel pretty good? Well, I, I have a couple of examples. Uh, you know, we had Anderson Moran hitting a home run against Dallas, uh, you know, and hardly played this year in a, in a varsity role, hitting that home run. Uh, another player from the softball team, Madison Mazenko, had a game-winning hit against Tunkanik for the longest time. That was her only hit of the season, but it came against one of the top pitchers in the Wild Conference. I believe uh, Russ has worked with Madison, too, uh, on her hitting, and it definitely came through in that instance. I, I look back to last year's softball team, Hope Kinney, uh, taking time out of her class day to work with special needs kids, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. and uh, it, it was really, it really put things in perspective. Uh, you know, to, she, she was a heck of a softball player, a leader on the team, power hitting catcher, but here she was helping special needs kids and they all respected her and uh, uh, adored her for what she did. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, shout out to, to Hope for doing that. Anything from you, Russ? I mean, you're, you're a coach now. I mean, do you think of anything even you're playing today days, you thought, hey, this isn't in the stats, but... This yeah. is a good sports story. Yeah, you know, I, I, I agree with Dave. I mean, the freshest one in my mind is, is yesterday with, with Anderson Moran, who, you know, is just an unbelievable character kid and has worked hard and has never complained and never, you know, and, and, and he got an opportunity yesterday and, and really won the game for us, you know, and I think that just showed a lot of, a lot of character, a lot of, a lot of perseverance as an, as an individual. So uh, I think there's a lot that we can, we can draw on from those, from those stories. Well, Russ, I, I thank you for your time. Dave, I thank you for your time. We're going to be doing this regularly, podcast and also um, web series. It's called Good Sports with Dave and Ken. And the cool thing is we've talked about a lot of the stories we kind of did, Dave. We talked about your welcoming story, um, welcoming Russ as Hazleton area baseball coach. We also talked about the Father's Day piece you did. You can do some digging at standardspeaker.com. Check out some of these articles. And also at ssptv.com, you could find, oh, Russ, I wish I could find the date. But I think if you, I'll get the date. I'll post it on our Facebook page because you have to see me and Russ playing Xbox together. I was so nervous first day for my new job. I was nervous today, first podcast. And Russ, it calms you down. I mean, a lot. You beat me, by the way, um, when we played that Served game. Served a couple up. And yeah. actually, in a special Dave Day on Community NEPA News, so watch that um, coming up. Um, we're going to discuss that with Russ. But for the first good sports, Dave, how, how, how do we do it? I, mean, I think we did okay. I don't know. I guess it's up to the listeners, the viewers. Yeah. yeah. A lot I'm of fun. A lot of fun. I think I the input would be, you know what? It's a good show. Dave and Russ, keep them coming. And maybe I'll, like... I mean, Russ has a the media short media. guy in the middle with the Hafey shirt on. But um, remember your Hafey days. That's right. All right, everybody, right, thank right. you for listening or watching. And remember, you can read more great sports stories at standardspeaker.com and watch them at sspeaktv.com. You've been listening to Good Sports with Dave and Ken, brought to you by SSPTV and the Hazleton Standard Speaker.